The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The apostles returned from their mission. They gathered around Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And he hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. You know, today's scriptures focus on the shepherds of the people, those deputed by God to provide leadership. In the gospel reading, we have uh, a story that really references to a great deal the apostles and what they've been up to. Uh, but it's also clear from the Old Testament reading, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, that this is not understood solely in terms of religious leadership. The concern is for all leadership, temporal and spiritual. And this reflects the Judeo-Christian conviction that all leadership is ordained by God. And so it ought to be guided by God's precepts, you know, the moral law, the wisdom of Christ, the disciplines of the community of the faithful, that is, how we would understand it, the church. All leaders then have as their primary task the bringing of the people to God, bringing them to God in the deepening of the holiness of their lives, in the deepening of their relationship with God, and then having the rootedness in righteousness be then the source of all action thereafter. Now, how that happens in the realm of political leadership is in how that leadership maintains the safety and well-being of people, and more importantly, their freedom, so as to pursue the happiness one will find in God. So a sinful, self-indulgent, decadent, and morally decrepit people, well, they'll not make good decisions individually or collectively. They will not choose well the policies that further promote righteousness, justice, charity, so on, even as they believe that these will be the consequences of their choices will be the result of the leadership they choose. In the end, not even their own well-being will be preserved as they no longer can understand the logical consequences of their actions or those of their leaders because they no longer know good from evil, truth from lies. You know, one can readily see how initial bad decisions that lead us astray will only compound as we in our corruption begin to grow in selfishness, self-concern, and become preoccupied more with our appearance as good and righteous, even as the substance of our lives grows rotten. However, occasionally, someone can cut through our self-delusion, our self-righteousness, our self-justification to recall us to true righteousness and our need for genuine justification in the eyes of God. Of course, that example par excellence is Jesus Christ. But we too also have the apostles. We see them at work today. And before them, in the time of the Old Testament, the prophets. You know, you'll note in the gospel we just heard the following verses. The apostles returned from their mission. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd. So what is happening is that the apostles, by their faithful execution of their Lord's instructions, become recognizable to the people as Jesus' representatives. Insofar as these people follow these 12 men, the result is not that they become followers of Peter or John or James, but they're actually led to Christ. In fact, there comes a point in this brief story where most people figure out where the apostles are headed and so arrive ahead of them, making that great crowd on the shore that greets Jesus. You know, that is, or at least ought to be, 
the prayed for goal of every pastor, every deacon, priest, bishop, and pope, that by example, by preaching and teaching, they come to be known as someone sent by Jesus. And then as people see where they are headed in their personal walk of faith, they surpass them. And at some point in your journeys of faith, that you know where Christ is, and you go running to him. It's an exciting thing to see as a pastor. It still involves me as a priest, as one who can then act less as a guide and more as a coach, a trainer, or more simply like that person of support who, you know, volunteers for the marathon and hands out water to the runners who know where the finish line is. It's always my job to help others as pastor in this movement toward God, whether it is the rescue of the lost, instruction of the flock, encouragement in continuing this long and often difficult journey. The great temptation for me and for other pastors is to stray from this work, to seek to be relevant in the eyes of the world, to attach myself to causes, to involve myself in politics. You ought not to be surprised that I am approached to endorse political causes. I wouldn't think I'm that big a, an influencer in our community, but I do get approached from time to time. Now those who ask, I don't think they understand themselves as, as asking for political endorsement. For them, they are asking me to simply declare something that they hold to be a great truth, to champion something that they, they see as simply a matter of justice to signal to the congregations under my charge that say allegiance to this or that cause is now an indicator of faith, a sign of one's personal righteousness and favor in God's eyes. You know, for those who ask this of me, they don't see any complexity in what they're promoting. Yet, you know, I've been trained in theology and philosophy, and I have no pretense to be a Latter-day Saint Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, but I have been taught some disciplines of mine to analyze things. I can often see this as being not so straightforward, what I'm being asked. That there's something capable of genuine, sincere debate amongst good people about the question they've raised. And so I refuse. I refuse to run the item in the bulletin, the website, send out an email. Now I'll give you a concrete example, and a very recent one. The local Protestant churches sent me an email asking me if I would run an item in our bulletin and elsewhere on the issue of expanding the city's boundaries that would involve the rezoning of agricultural land. It's a legitimate issue. I declined. Why? Well, for one, the item was a piece written and being distributed by the Stop the Sprawl group here. So the piece was biased to one side of the question. And that's a problem. And without taking sides, but drawing on my training in logic, it was very easy for me to very quickly look at the other side of this question and make a good argument in favor of boundary expansion. So, for example, it, it would provide more land for housing that would increase the supply, which might help lower the astronomical housing prices we're seeing today. That is then a matter of social justice itself. If you choke the supply of land, this favors those who already own their homes. It increases their value, their wealth, at the expense of shutting out families from the housing market and keeping them in rental properties, likely for good. Is that fair? Is that justice? Now, I've said that simply as an example, as an exercise that I did at my desk in the space of two minutes upon reading this email that I got. I'm not making a public declaration on this question one way or another. I'm simply illustrating my point. If I use the resources of this parish to promote one side of this question, what am I turning this parish into? Is this then the church for Catholics who oppose urban sprawl? If you're someone who disagrees with that position, are you welcome here anymore? We're not here to adjudicate this question or any other number of policy issues. We're here to form people so that with well-informed conscience, they can be in the world and contribute to this discussion and decision-making on other matters in a manner that allows them to set aside prejudice, examine a particular situation, and figure out what the right and good thing is to do. 
And I think it's a good thing if this parish, its membership, discuss things like the Hamilton city boundary or any other matter of public importance, and that they do so informed by their faith. We're here to deepen our relationship with God through Christ, to learn from that what is good and evil, but more importantly, how readily we can dece be deceived by both ourselves and others in our discernment of good and evil. So approach all these questions with humility. This is a place of spiritual formation. Insofar as I discuss the world of politics, it is in how it has forgotten its proper role in our lives. How political leaders liken themselves to say moral philosophers presumed to act as bishops and priests in declaring what the church ought and ought not to do. Now, I was reflecting on the fact the other day, I was prompted this by an article I was reading about how our head of state, the queen, in her coronation, undertook to preserve protect and uphold the law of God and to be guided by the wisdom of the gospel. That was just 70 years ago. I know that that will seem like a long time for those under 40, but that's scarcely an instant within the long story of humanity, both in its history and in its myth. My, how quickly things have changed. Where are we today? Very far from this understanding of leadership. And I mentioned the Queen's coronation oath, the whole of that ceremony that surrounded her receiving of royal authority, because that royal authority is the basis of Canada's state authority. Yet as I look at the state of those lands that still look to Elizabeth Windsor as their monarch, I'm disturbed. I'm disturbed to see moral decay that has translated into political, social, and economic chaos. And that chaos has dire consequences for us all, but especially for those who are going to come after us. I have a soft spot for Her Majesty. I rather think she should have abdicated decades ago and allowed us just simply to be republics, strip away that thin veneer of divine sanction conferred upon our political system by her presence within it. It might have made the job of the church clearer to the hierarchy, to the clergy, to us all. We're here to help ourselves and, well, everyone know Jesus. We are to bring people to him so that they might know him. In knowing him then, when confronted by the vexing questions of politics, but also of family life, work life, and so on, when we fall back upon that basic and almost cliche question, what would Jesus do? We might just stand a chance of answering it.